methods through which modern Kerala's history has been invoked and made available for inhabitation. Perhaps the most valorized concept here is that of Navothanam, which is usually translated into English as Renaissance, although a more literal equivalent would perhaps be resurgence, which has prompted the production of a narrative template that dovetails the caste and community reform movements of the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, and the emergence of a print public sphere with anti-colonial and communist movements, and then governmental developmental initiatives of which the Kerala model represents probably the most prominent uh, example. This narrative of self-making, modernity and democratization forms the core of what one may call Kerala's nationalist discourse, based on the idea of a national community, even if it, it is not coeval with the uh, nation state as such, and is frequently invoked as an object of nostalgia or as a talisman of inspiration against anti-modern regression. The anchoring remembrance thus offered is meant to encompass all communities. As we know, a feature of nationalist discourse is its inability and it is its ability and its need to incorporate all communities within itself without having to deny their plurality. This is the logic of transcendence that Ajay Skaria and Alan Confino pointed out a long time ago. The idea that the plural, the particular, the local, and the distinctive would find their true significance in terms of the national, which should provide the master template and the lenses for reading and charting their distinctiveness. The texts I considered from the beginning of the last century were all associated with the moment of the Navothanam, the figuration of the non-narrativizable, the forces that operate at a lower level in those texts, be they autobiographies, historical novels, or poems about the individuation of desire, give an insight into the difficult work involved in the production and inhabitation of a new set of feelings and relationships that would later become hegemonic. The history of Malayalam literature, especially the novel in the 20th century, offers useful insights into the incorporation of plural community histories into a Kerala history. Often the distinctiveness of the community, marked in its language or customs or attitudes, is invoked with indulgence and irony before a new composite public. Authenticity is often marked by the presence of a habitus of ways of being that are so insufficiently modern and are difficult to own or occupy except through an innocent and tolerant irony. The most successful instances of this, be it in some texts by Bajir or Sakaria or VKN, speaks to the strange complexity of selfhood shared by the novel's ironic world and its authors and readers. The ethnographic impulse, which accompanied the novel since its inception and contributed substantially to the language of realism, acquired a new depth, exceeded the protocols of realism, and subjected the present to an ironic self-distanciation in writers such as Bashir, Zakaria, and Vikay. The focus of my more recent work, which is what I wish to share with you, has been on certain forms of writing that do not submit to the ambivalent pleasures of recollection of the past and self-location in the present, which I indicated above. The writers of these texts have come from communities and social locations that have a more difficult relationship with the hegemonic self-images of Kerala's modernity, notably the Dalit and coastal communities. My aim in this brief talk is to outline some modes of recollection and affective configurations that appear in these writers and to propose a few brief remarks in conclusion about the figures through which we may conceive the subject of historical remembrance and thus indirectly the location that we call the present. In this, I hope this talk will have some relevance beyond the concerns of 
writing from Kerala. My point of entry into these new forms of imagination was through the work of C. A. Yepen, whose quantitatively meager body of powerful short stories offers an exemplary staging of forms of remembrance and experience that resist incorporation into hegemonic modes of historical recall. I must request the indulgence of those in the audience who are already familiar with my discussions of IAPN's work. I shall be very brief in summarizing only some principal points. In my readings of IAPN, I had made a distinction prompted by the desire for analytical economy and based on the affective tenor of the stories between what I call daytime or diurnal stories and nighttime or nocturnal ones. The daytime stories by and large explore the dislocation experienced by Dalit subjects in modern spaces of publicness, institutions and domesticity, while nighttime stories stage the familiar spaces of realist narration as haunted by the dead, making it difficult to draw boundaries between the diurnal and the nocturnal, the empirical and the spectral. Arguably, the most powerful of Ayyappan stories are narrated by the spirits of Dalits who, after taking their own lives, return to possess the living. Preta Pashanam, or ghost speech, and Kaval Pudam, or guardian spirit, are prominent examples of this. These stories take the form of intimate autobiographical explanations offered by the dead to the bodies of the living that they have taken hold of. First person life narration moves outwards from the personal to reveal a world in shambles. The vision releases an uncontainable intensity manifested in the narrator's voice as violent lamentation or insane laughter. A new vision of the world is made available through the breakdown of the individual character subject who is unable to serve as the bearer of the intensities of which it has become the locus. In an interview, Ayyappan was asked a question about Dalit Atmiyada, a word that is usually translated as spirituality. He responded by connecting it with Atmakal, the Malayalam word for souls or spirits, and defining it as an empowering awareness of the chain of ancestors and their histories. Viewed in this light, haunting in Ayyappan stories might appear as a mode in which historical inheritance marks its presence. Unquiet spirits do not, however, offer any anchorage or purposive agency for the characters possessed by them. The narrative's affective intensities attach less to the life histories of individual subjects than to situations and spaces, the matrices within which they are placed the fields, the lanes, the shrine of the goddess, the soundscape of bird cries that emerges when dusk descends on the familiar neighborhood. Such preoccupation with space and territory in their nocturnal, ghost-inhabited transformations is crucial for the writers that we shall consider today. In Ayyappan stories, death and spirit possession signal intensive modes of relationship with the present and the past, which diverge from what one may call the daylight world of historical knowledge. This is not to suggest that the phenomenon of death necessarily defies the disciplinary protocols of history. The documentation of death, rehearsed and amplified in the obituary, may be seen as an elementary mode of historical inscription, as it involves chronological marking, and intergenerational remembrance. Haunting places its stress, however, not on the discrete and temporarily determinable nature of the event, but on its uncontainability. Ghostly presences cross the borders between the living and the dead, the past and the present, to disrupt the linear unfolding of time and to rehearse discontinuities. The ghost stories from his locality which Ayyappan had listened to as a child, were about bad or inauspicious Dalit deaths, suicides, murders, accidents that could mask murders, that do not and cannot find a place in documented history. 
a new avenue of unrecorded Dalit past is thus opened in Ayyappan's work by the staging of the present as haunted and unamenable to narrative consolidation. This act of recollection is surrounded by fear, refusal, and poignancy. In an interview, Ayyappan recalled that the stories to which he listened as a child in intense fear and rapt fascination led to a mental breakdown when he began to see ghosts whenever a shade moved. He resolutely closed the door to the world of spirits and became a rationalist and later on a communist. He noted that it was only the communists who treated him as a human being at that time and that some of the worst experiences of caste humiliation he experienced were from members of lower caste communities who had spearheaded the social reform movement. It is in this refusal, the shutting of the door to a certain non-modern mode of historical recall that arguably kept Ayyappan sane and made it possible for him to become a writer. But as a writer, it is precisely the world behind the closed door that he tries to access. Through the crevices between and beneath the closed doors, through a mode of spectral invocation, across a gap of historical discontinuity. Ayyappan's work is read often in the specific context of Dalit writing in Malayalam, but from a literary historical perspective, it may be seen as presaging a new approach to subaltern past manifested in Malayalam fiction. This approach finds its support in fictional works by writers such as Raju K. Vasu, P.F. Matthews, Joni Miranda, Pradeep and Pambrikuna, and Francis Norona. The intertwining of history with death and afterlife assumes distinctive forms in each of these writers and merits separate detailed discussion, which of course is not possible in this brief talk. I will confine myself to a few brief remarks. Raju K. Vasu's novel Chavutulal, The Spirit Dance, published in 2011, is set in the 1920s and narrates the story of the search for a new life by landless Pulea families who toil in the paddy fields of Kutanad through migration to plantations in the hills near Kanyarapalli and Mundakai and through conversion to Christianity. The life they strive to escape is marked by hunger, violent oppression and death, characteristic of the lives of enslaved people who are tied tied to the land uh, they till. The narrative of aspiration and liberation is interwoven with the story of spirits. Kali, who was burned alive in her hut by the upper caste for her spirited defiance, appears after her death as a passionate lover, a staunch defender of women's dignity, and a protective guide to the next generation of Dalits. The spirits of the dead, especially those who, like Kali, were killed for their resistance to oppression, bring to the fictional world an affective tenor linked less with anger and revenge than joy and the affirmation of life. Hopefulness and resoluteness, rather than mourning and lamentation, mark their commemoration by the living. Eri, published in 2017, the only novel written by the renowned literary critic Pradeep and Pambirikuna, and published after his untimely and tragic death is perhaps the most direct fictional engagement in Malayalam with the affirmative dimensions of Dalit ancestry and the problems of the archive faced by contemporary Dalit historians. The narrative takes the form of an account by a young Dalit academic researcher to recover the history of the life of Eri, the legendary hero of the Paraya community, who is believed to have been alive in the second half of the 19th and the first quarter of the 20th century. Snatches of the story come to the researcher narrator from various unwritten sources, beginning with an anecdote recounted by his father. As the novel progresses, fragmentary traces from the past, access through memory and hearsay, proliferate without always fitting well with each other. The narrator also reflects on his methods and on the validity of memory as a resource for writing history. 
the effect is not a relativization or attenuation of truth claims, but the creation of an image of subaltern history, which can be accessed only in the mode of a legend to which each fragment contributes a striking and inspirational facet. Anecdotal recollections on Eri work like snapshots taken at varied moments and produce a non-linear biographical collage that shows the protagonist at different points in his life. This collection of images triggers attempts by the researcher and narrator to plot them in chronological and consequential series. But these efforts produce further proliferations of traces, which do not result in a chronologically coherent record. What emerges is a complex image of a rich subaltern tradition of knowledge, courage, ethics, and love, which is an ideal and an object of longing. Novels from and, and about coastal communities in Kochi is another prominent site where histories of subaltern communities have been explored in relation to death, haunting, and the inhabitation of spaces. These novels are set in the islands and ayots that form part of the unique geography of Kochi, which brings together river, land, and ocean, prominently associated with Kerala's long history of oceanic connections and with histories of pre-colonial occupations by the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the English, which left their marks on the landscape, the life practices of the people, Dalit and lower caste people who converted to Christianity under Portuguese rule in the 17th century, and the language spoken in the region. The best known novel written about this region is arguably uh, Litanies of the Dutch Battery, an English translation, London Bateriele Lutiniagal in Malayalam, published in 2003 by N.S. Mathaven, a renowned short story writer from Ernakulam. Mathaven's novel is set in an imaginary island, London Bateri or Dutch Battery, named after a battery of cannons supposedly installed by the Dutch. The novel follows the first 16 uh, years of the life of Jessica a girl born on the island in 1951. If the political and cultural history of Kerala and beyond Kerala forms a crucial temporal coordinate of the novel, another axis is provided by the longer history of the island and the people traversed by three colonial regimes. I cite this novel only to mark its distance from the forms of historical recall that we have been exploring so far. The autobiographical narrative voice of London Bate shuttles between the position of the protagonist, whose life unfolds on the island, and that of an implied commentator subject who looks at the island from a certain spatio temporal distance. Like the entire novel is written as a first person narrative from the point of view of the protagonist, this girl. But sometimes the tone of the narration is that of somebody who is commenting on this life world as if from a distance, which would be in the future. One may see the narrative voice, this narrative voice as a reversal of what we usually call free and direct mm. discourse. In free and direct discourse, a third person narrative is colored by a character's first person stance and voice. Here, the third person commentatorial voice seeps into the first person narrative of the protagonist to frame the text within a larger Kerala history. Descriptions at times assume a tone of remembrance at variance with the logic of the first person voice, as if the protagonist's perception is already mediated by a tone of retrospection that can only take place in a possible future when the objects and practices being described would have become traces of a past that can be curated and viewed with nostalgic pleasure. A different approach to the writing of the life world of island communities in Kochi is found in the novels of writers such as P.F. Matthews and Johnny Miranda. And these resonate with the forms of historical recall we have been exploring. The novels of Matthews and Miranda, written over the past two or three decades, are immersed in the life of the Latin Catholic community who converted from Dalit or low caste to Christianity under Portuguese dominance 
in the 16th and the early 17th centuries. Vernacular idioms and life practices forged through the amalgamation of Christian beliefs and cultural forms that came with the Portuguese, the community's social and economic marginalization, and past redolent with the history of native and transoceanic slavery intermingle in these novels to shape the life world of the island community. Many of the novels about the Kochi Islands refer to a myth involving an enormous treasure buried underground with interdictions on accessing it and greed-driven efforts to unearth it, meeting with calamitous ends. The key version of this myth involves human sacrifice, alkuridi mm. or narabeli in Malayalam, a trope not unfamiliar to the popular memory of slavery in Kerala. According to this myth, when the Portuguese in Kochi were defeated by the Dutch in 1663, forced to abandon their possessions and flee the city, they buried their riches underground, killed an African slave and interred him alongside and entrusted his ghost to guard the treasure. In some invocations of the myth, this was a singular sacrifice, while others speak of the sacrifice of several slaves. In the community memory of the islanders, the dead slaves from centuries ago still walk the earth, appearing tall in a white coat and smoking a cigar. This slave ghost is referred to as Kapiri Muttapem in Malayalam, combining the word Kapiri, which derives from Kafir and used for designating Black Africans, and Muttapem, a kinship term used for referring to one's grandfather or grand uncle, also used for certain deities propitiated in non brahmanical vernacular devotional practices in Kerala, which were interestingly forms of worship that caste reform movements during the Navothanam tried to suppress. The presence of the myth of enslaved Africans in contemporary novels from Kochi is intriguing. While regarding this as a sign of the persistence of memories of an African connection erased by subsequent colonial and nationalist histories, Nilima Jaychandran suggests that the manner in which the memories of African spirits are circulated in Kochi shows that forms of activation of the past are reflective of a collective imagination that is local, especially concerning memories of African bondage and broader significance about systems of discrimination, particularly with the subaltern coastal communities. We need to think further. The plot of P.F. Matthews's novel, Adiyala Pradam, uh, The Slave Ghost, is centered on an iteration of the trope of human sacrifice in more recent times, with a landowner killing his Dalit servant slave as a final offering to obtain the treasure from Kapiri Mutapen. The novel unfolds through an investigation into the disappearance of the Dalit and his family carried out by two police officers, one of whom is a Dalit young man. He is eventually revealed to be the spirit of the enslaved Dalit's child, who was also killed along with the rest of his family. Through the tropes of human sacrifice and spectral afterlife, the novel's imaginary links the distant presence of enslaved Africans on the Kochi coast with unrecognized histories of Dalit slavery and bondage in Kerala. Even where this connection is not part of the plot as it is in Adiyala Pratham, the myth of Kapiri Mutapan extends its long shadow into the present in other contemporary novels from the region. One may argue that the invocation of African slavery serves as a screen narrative that allows these novels to establish a shadowy relationship with suppressed local histories of enslavement and suffering without directly thematizing them. The subterranean presence of dead bodies, mostly anonymous and abandoned, defines the spatial depth of P.F. Matthews's novel, Chavunilam, which literally means the land of spirits. The preoccupation with the secret underground world of the dead is framed in the novel by the story of settlements, a recurrent trope intimately linked to land the landlessness of Dalit and coastal communities. 
The spatiality of the novel has its temporal counterpart in the curse. The island is presented as being under its ominous power. One may regard the curse as a temporal force that links the past and the present, like the passage under the pond through which spirits come up and delimits the horizon beyond which the present is forbidden to move. The novels I mentioned rethink the dominant temporal frames within which Kerala's present is located. By moving away from realism and ethnographic styles for representing <clears throat> marginalized communities, they open new ways of staging problems of historical inheritance. But they also foreground a set of considerations whose relevance may go beyond Kerala. This is why I decided to put the in Kerala within brackets in the title. These considerations have to do with the relations between remembrance and forms of subjectivity opened up in these texts through the mise en scene of a haunted present accomplished through the invocation of ghosts and their inhabitation of the world of the living, which we call, after missionary writings and colonial anthropology, spirit possession. Who do the spirits haunt and possess? In other, word, in other words, who is the subject of the spectral mode of historical inheritance? The anthropologist Kalpana Ram, in her fascinating book, Fertile Disorder, studied the experience of spirit possession among fisherwomen in southern Kanyakumari district of Tamil Nadu, adjacent to South Kerala. Moving away from anthropological studies that see in possession a symptomatology of breakdown of life worlds or a disguised rebellion against oppressive power, Kalpana Ram sees the possessed person not so much as engaged in an active performance of counter violence or resistance than as open or vulnerable to the memory of an injustice that is refused accommodation in social memory. In other words, possession involves the housing of a homeless remembrance, a memory in search of a subject that opens herself like a wound to intensities without a home, thus constituting a nocturnal membrane of the social, legible to others only as the travails of the possessed. Kalpana Ram says, one of the perennial questions that creates a difficulty for social science interpretations of possession is this. Why do certain individuals become possessed and not others? The difficulty is partly addressed if we include the affective dimension of existence. For it is this capacity to be affected by the suffering and violent end of others that is the prerequisite for the particular kinds of possessions being discussed here. Such a capacity is also the prerequisite for bearing witness. And the bearing of witness is one way in which we might understand such possession. It is this capacity unevenly distributed within any social group that seems to allow ghosts to find their particular individuals who can serve as their witnesses, often in pitiable and dramatic ways. This is a quote from Kalpana Ram. Ram's analysis may help us to understand the affective spectation staged in Ayyappan's ghost narratives. The spectator subjects within the stories, even when they are victims of the spirit's rage, are also witnesses whose affective borders have been broken open by the events of injustice from which suffering spirits emerge. The reader, in turn, is involved in this circulation of affective witnessing, which relies on one's vulnerability and porousness rather than on rational and morally stable positions of appraisal. In other words, we are in the presence of a mode of remembrance that finds its ground not in a repository, in an instituted archive, be it external or internal, but in the permeability of the subject who houses a remembrance that wandered homeless in the social domain. This structure, most directly thematized in IFN stories, is also present in the perceptual world of the novels we consider today. 
anger, rage, deep sorrow brought to these texts by the ghosts indicate a dimension of effective history that exceeds narrative legibility to demand an intensive, affective order of receptivity. In other words, they demand a permeable subject as the site of this difficult historical inheritance. But the possessed subjects of the narratives and we as readers are permeable witness figures affected by the intensities that cannot be attributed to characters as sovereign agents. I shall conclude by noting a couple of aspects of permeability, a dimension of existence that opens the borders of proper selfhood and opens us to others. Firstly, unlike the determination of sympathy through moral appraisal, permeability belongs to a lower threshold of our existence. The plane of our fragility, our vulnerability to violence and unjust death as living and sensei beings. This threshold has assumed vital importance in the present. Contemporary arrangements of power, as we know, directly produce, refer to, and operate on this plane of human life, thus rendering it irreversibly political. Remem remembrance at this lower threshold, this destitute plane to invoke one of the senses in which Anike Javre used this concept in practicing caste, ought to be distinguished from associations that presume society and understood instead in relation to an elementary plane of connections and contact that relies on our capacity to be affected. Secondly, this may also open a way to revisit conceptions of the collective and rethink ideas of solidarity. Would it be possible to envisage a destitute plane of solidarity that does not refer to shared attributes or possessions or rights, or depend on protocols that regulate the exchange of objects, even gift exchange in an economy, and refers instead to fragility, mutual exposure, and porosity, and the elementary forms of feeling with and standing with that arises from them. The forms of remembrance staged in the text we considered point towards this elementary plane. That seems to be the site where paths of heroic resistance as well as suffering and sacrifice become available as inheritance. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and patience. Right. Thank you so much. Ade. That was such a rich, rich talk, really. I mean, we have no words. It was so mesmerizing and we didn't really want you to stop over there. So thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful exposition. Uh, so uh, Anne will take you through the questions. Anne, should I pa pass on the virtual mic to you? Yeah. I think we'll just have to give her one more minute. Aparna is taking care of the controls. I see. Right, right. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes, absolutely. Right, thank you so much. And I'm very sorry for that small uh, glitch from my end. Uh, but uh, Professor Uday Kumar, that was, that was fantastic. And thank you so very much uh, for, uh, for your time and for your words. Um, so, sir, if, if you allow, I will pose one question after another to you. And to all the participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to also post it in the chat box that is there on Zoom, as well as um, at the YouTube live stream comments. I'm picking questions from um, different, these two avenues. Um, so Professor Uday Kumar, the first question that we've received reads, thank you for this enlightening, thought, enlightening talk. Um, I wanted to request your thoughts on the extent to which these various modes of historical recall 
um, go into articulating a mode of resistance in contemporary times. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, like, uh, like most of our research, you know, this, this, this was also prompted by things which are happening in the present. And one of the things which uh, all of us have noticed in the past, uh, recent past, is um, the coming into the foreground of certain forms of resistance and refusal, which uh, in a way uh, are a little different from uh, the more familiar postures of defiance and resistance, like the more agentive, the more assertive, uh, uh, how should I put it, the more active, seemingly active forms of resistance. Sometimes, uh, very often, we have seen forms of resistance taking the form of uh, people just uh, sitting or standing in a place and not really um, showing the signs of an active agitation, but steadfastness, quiet resoluteness. We have also seen lamentation being used as a form of expression of resistance and defiance. Mourning. Uh, so many kinds of posters of resistance which we previously associated with passivity have become increasingly important as forms of resistance. And this is in some sense not surprising because it has also to uh, do with the point of application of power in our times. When the point of application of power is at the level of living existence, forms of resistance which foreground this, demonstrate this, and mobilize this also come up uh, against it. So this really has been one of the uh, one of the points of departure for some of the thoughts which I presented in this talk. And the very idea of permeability, which is at a level of uh, level, what I call the lower, lower threshold of human life existence, which is actually below the level of claimable rights, et cetera, et cetera, comes from this intuition, which really comes to us from the world around us. So, so this is one response I have. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, the next question is from Dr. Paramita Patronobish, and I read the question. Do modes of spectral inhabitation in these narratives transform or intervene into territorial configurations of space, especially into the ways in which hegemonic historical narratives are spatialized and exist as how places and access to places, including sites of public memory, are often policied and regulated. There is also a second question, which if you allow, sir, I will post. Sure. Sure. The second question reads from um, Dr. Patronobish itself. The question is, what is the relationship between the subaltern temporally of temporality of spectral remembrance and the already inscribed materiality of inhabited space, especially in slave narratives? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Paramita. Great to have you here. <clears throat> uh, these, these are very important and also difficult questions. And certainly haunting and uh, uh, being affected uh, by spectral forces, which are in some sense below the level of the ordinary perception world, so to say, or below the level of clearly demarcated political spaces uh, this form of this dynamic of uh, haunting certainly comes up against and violates the divisions and the charting which has uh, uh, which has been established or instituted by uh, the official the institutional forms of territorialization and and there I feel that uh, many of these narratives which I mentioned about are really mentioned are really about spaces and spatial technologies, whether it be uh, Chavanilam, which I mentioned uh, towards the end of the talk, there is a certain idea of the verticality of spaces and this verticality, see verticality comes up in, as an idea in many of these 
historically sensitive narratives, which are also about a certain archaeology, like digging deep. Yeah? And uh, especially novels about uh, uh, Kochi, the islands of Kochi, uh, you get these narratives speaking about like uh, museumizing narratives, like N.S. Madhavan's uh, novel, speaking about uh, the different layers of history which are buried underneath this. But these la different layers of history are really like recorded history. You could say that this journey down is a journey through the archives, so to say, a kind of officially available or academically available archive or a public archive. Whereas in Chavanilam, it is really about these abandoned dead bodies, the burial grounds, and the spirit es spirits escaping into uh, spaces of uh, ordinary or everyday life, like the ponds. Uh, so there is clearly a disruption of space. In fact, haunting is uh, very often associated with spaces and their mutability. And, and the second question uh, is, uh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the second question. Could could you read out the second question once more, Anne? That yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the second question is, what is the relationship between the subaltern temporality of spectral remembrance and the already inscribed materiality of inhabited space, especially in slave narratives? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, th this is a very, very difficult question. You know, the... Um, in in the in the context of the uh, Afro-American slavery, we we know uh, about some of the uh, really imaginative ways in which uh, slave temporality or the temporality of uh, uh, the spectral spectral temporality which comes into slave experience is thematized. Now, in particular, uh, thinking about um, Fred Morton's reading of Harriet Jacob, the crawl space, the appearance of the vision right in the middle of the living space, et cetera, et cetera. And there, uh, the, the challenging part of this spectral recollection, especially in the context of uh, the narratives that I have been looking at, is on the one hand, there is a kind of uh, evacuation, an evacuation the absence of a past, like you can't reach out to uh, generations because that has been kind of obliterated, that memory has been obliterated. This is also a problem which comes up in Afro-American slave narratives. But on the other hand, there is also the idea of uh, uh, these specters which are there, which can be propitiated, which might be there uh, as part of a kind of lineage which is denied recognition. Sometimes I feel that the narratives oscillate between these two possibilities. Like in Ayyapan himself, there are in, in the interviews when he speaks about Atmakar, it is presented in a positive sense as a resource, as a strengthening, enabling inheritance. But on the other hand, there is also the disconsolate absence which surrounds the present, that time does not have any consolation available. That is the live present. So this is something which uh, 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 I could say in response to what you asked about the materiality of the live spaces uh, that I need to think more. In, in Chavanilam, for example, of course, the materiality of live spaces are turned into a kind of a, a different kind of theater for the conduit, for the coming out of the past, whether it be the well or the pond or the even the marshland itself, they suddenly become like uh, spaces which are transformed by the eruption of a certain uh, suppressed part of history, a suppressed, suppressed past, which suddenly erupts and destroys it. So such things do come up, but this needs more thinking. Thank you, Parameda. The next question, thank you, sir. The next question is from Grace. Professor Kumar, when we talk about the effective histories of marginalization as found in the writers that you discussed in your talk, how do we understand Kerala's Renaissance movement? Yes. 
Yeah, see, this this is really the thank you, Grace, for asking the question. This is really the the uh, uh, the context of uh, presenting this in some sense now, because uh, you know that there has been a invocation of uh, the idea of Renaissance in recent years. Yeah, in some sense, there is what I would call a monumentalization of the moment of the Renaissance, which also means that we do not really have a critical relationship to it. That is a clear sign of the forces of whatever was radical and transformative about the Renaissance, probably having spent itself because it has become acceptable. It has become tame, so to say. Yeah. And, and this is particularly evident in the, uh, in the way in which uh, the most potent figures of that moment, like uh, 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 Sri Narayana Guru, for example, you know, have become universally acceptable from the extreme left to the extreme right of the political spectrum. So that also makes it very difficult to recover them for critical companionship, for interlocution now, for companionship now. For that, we probably need to re-understand the Renaissance, displace the Renaissance from the kind of pedestal that it occupies at the moment, and then open it up to other energies and other histories, which also became obscured by virtue of this valorization. What you find in Pradeep and Pambarikunna's Eri is one attempt of that kind, where this Paraya uh, protagonist, legend, legendary figure, is occupying exactly the same time period as what we call the Kerala Renaissance. And he has his own relationships with that, but there is a history of another Renaissance or an another st other strands of the Renaissance, which existed at that time, whose suppression has created the temporal template that I spoke about. Now, interestingly, the ghost narratives uh, or the ghost presences, which Raju K. Vasu inscribes in his uh, novels, they also take place around the same time. But for the people in that, in those novels, especially Chavutulla, it is not really the time of Renaissance. So Renaissance appears in the form of migration, the form of flight from the site of oppression, creating a new life by becoming plantation workers. So these are some of the ways in which a new opportunity for looking at what we have uh, rendered, um, uh, how should I say, unavailable for critical companionship by the word Navodhanam can probably be approached again, uh, not in its exclusiveness, but as part of a wider and more complex configuration. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Chinmaya Lal, and the question reads, thank you so much, sir, for your talk. I just wanted to ask how the diasporic presence influences some of the ideas you mentioned. I am thinking of writers like Benjamin, Benjamin mm. and the immigrant figure in the Gulf who is also precariously placed. Right, yeah, yeah. This, uh, thank you, Chinmay. It's a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, see, uh, it, it is true about uh, Benjamin and the contemporary, um, uh, contemporary or the let's say the 20th century, the late 20th century uh, diaspora from uh, in the Gulf, Kerala diaspora in the Gulf. Uh, that's a very, very important phenomenon. Uh, also in upsetting many of the caste equations and community equations of power, uh, the, the, right and the, the rights and the claims that one can make to culture, et cetera, et cetera. But in the novels which uh, we are looking at, you know, which I, I spoke about, uh, the real uh, instances of migration which I've spoken about are really about the early part of the 20th century. And, and this is very important because uh, the kind of history of uh, aggressive slavery in Kerala, uh, many people escape from that, escape from the oppressive afterlife of that in the early 20th century by fleeing from places of cultivation and eventually getting to uh, the new plantations which are emerging. 
and there they become laborers, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there are new settlements also which are created in North Kerala in many places, Dalit settlements come up. There are novels about them. I did not really speak about Harry Kotakari and other novels, really because there was there is no time. But the idea of the settlement itself is so closely related to this question of the unavailability of land, the difficulty of uh, uh, creating a community which is which has its own territory, which has its own ground. And in that sense, the theme of uh, migration, uh, the theme of forced migration, these have great significance for this imagination. But apart from that, you know, about the actual uh, uh, direct impact of the Gulf diaspora, I really do not know, you know, if that is true about the kind of recollections that I am trying to uh, foreground here. In some of the early Dalit, uh, no, early novels, the first novel about a Dalit protagonist, which is Saraswati Vijayam in the late 19th century, you have, of course, uh, uh, a, a trans-oceanic migration being recorded, which is closely related to slave trade, a character being uh, captured as a slave and then sold into slave trade and eventually ending up in Australia, be becoming free, getting a new life, and then coming back and effecting certain changes in the, in the plot. So in that, that larger dimension is there, of course. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from PJ Thomas. How do you see the spirit of woman coming back as Yakshi in the legendary narrative of Kalyankata Nidhi? Do you consider it a ghost narrative? Yeah, the, this is uh, again very interesting because uh, Kalingat is uh, uh, a, again an important uh, uh, image from an early part of Malayali novel writing. And uh, uh, also, about similarly, there is a question of uh, history and historical recall involved in that, especially in C. V. Raman Pillay's historical novel, uh, Mahatanda Verma, where she is invoked very, very prominently. And you also know that there are folk versions of the story, you know, which are which are available, which uh, Raman Pillay was very much aware of. Now, what exactly is uh, a spirit? What exactly is this ghost? You know, this is really the kind of question uh, which it raises. In other words, what form of historical experience is actually recalled under the sign of a ghost? Yeah, and and there it's very important to remember that. Uh, there is some kind of unavowable discontinuity you know, or insufferable discontinuity between the past and the present, which comes up here. And there is some histories of violence, histories where violence was coded differently, where blood and bloodletting were coded differently, which uh, have become unavowable as memories now. And Kalinga Daneli, of course, is a figure who comes up as a reminder as an, uh, in an attempt to uh, seek revenge. Now, the contemporary possession narratives I spoke about can be seen as people offering some kind of housing to that kind of uh, uh, spirit which emerges. Yeah? So are these ghost stories you know, that that's... You know, I, whether they are part of a genre of the ghost story is less an interesting consideration. The question is, are these ghosts part of the, the work's temporality? Is its approach to history? Is it trying to negotiate something with historical experience through them? If that is the question, definitely I would say the figure of Kalinga is very important in the history of that in modern Malayalam writing. Thank you. Uh, if you will allow, I'll post two more questions. I know we've overshot the time a little bit. No problem. We can, we can go on as, uh, as long as you wish. Yeah, <laughs> no Thank problem. You. Very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the next question is from Fezan, Fezan Mukwin. And the question reads, how do you see the relation between the way a subject is possessed by a ghost and the idea of cosmotheoros as called by Jaw Lok Nancy, 
is there is possession a way to take a vantage point from which the world can be viewed as an object where the suppressed history can be represented okay uh, can you read that last sentence once more and yes of course is possession a way is possession a way to take a vantage point from which the world can be viewed as an object where the suppressed history can be represented right yeah 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 see um uh, as as i try to show uh, in these stories the possession has uh, the act of possession is primarily viewed from uh, the experience of the possessed yeah uh, which is really what interests me in relationship to the question of historical inheritance. Uh, in Ayyappan stories, they are staged as a narrative device. They are staged from the point of view of the spirit who possesses. Yeah? In fact, they are written, at least some of the stories are written, in the form of an explanation offered by the spirit to the object of its possession. In such story, in such uh, monologues, it is not um, as if uh, it is acquiring a vantage point from which the world can be objectified. I, I do not know if that would be an accurate description. One would need to think more about that. But it is more the case that there is some kind of voicing which becomes possible there. And not only some kind of voicing, some kind of command and control over the time of the world. I'll explain what I mean by that. Like there is one uh, story where the spirit possesses the woman, which the when it was alive, you know, the living person had loved, but the woman had married somebody else, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's a complicated story. And she's pregnant with her husband's child. And the spirit uh, threatens that, or spirit announces that now this pregnancy is going to go on and on. You are not going to have a child. Your pregnancy will extend into years. So similarly, in many stories, you will find an attempt to take hold of time, you know, take control of time, and to freeze it. This, but this is the uh, this is the spirit's the point of view which is attributed to the spirit. Ma, now. The important uh, point, in my view, is the experience of being possessed. That is really the historical inheritance. And there, as I uh, try to point out, there the important thing is about a certain kind of, uh, a certain vulnerability, a certain, what I have called a permeability of the subject, which allows it to house an injustice which does not have a home, the memory of which does not have a home, in the space of the social. This is also why these narratives are not realist narratives, because realism, insofar as it is predicated on the idea of the social, is precisely that which is uh, taken apart in this process. Yeah? So this is one quick uh, answer to your question. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Bharti Arora. Thank you, Professor Uday Kumar, for an interesting talk. My question is about the spectral dynamics of recall and how these recalls hint at characters' vulnerability to a memory of oppression or violence that has been erased by the dominant historiography. So, does this also hint in certain ways at the limitations embedded in the collective caste struggles and movements vis-a-vis -vis addressing the memories of oppression? If yes, how? Well, uh, this, uh, Bharati, uh, this is a difficult question because um, uh, at, you know, it, it's not really also the case that we are citing uh, these stories of privileging uh, certain individual wounds, wounds in their intensity at the individual level, which get obscured by the collective, collective mobilization, collective struggle, et cetera, et cetera. It is not as if there is a uh, privileging of the individual as a locus of greater authenticity of recall or uh, authenticity of the conservation of 
experience. Uh, the, the, what the possession, uh, uh, the staging of the possession, what, what it reaches out to is a space which I would say is before the before individuation and before the emergence of the collective. Okay? This is what I try to indicate by speaking about that uh, an elementary threshold of permeability. Now, of course, that is what, of course, is suppressed. That the, the suppression of that, of course, involves a suppression of uh, the wound, a suppression of injury, a suppression of uh, stigma, all kinds of things which are associated and which are inarticulable once this threshold is actually suppressed. Then with that suppression, this becomes, of course, available to us as a resource, which is archival, which can be used for consolidation, for collective, for politics, etc., etc. It is not that these stories are suggesting, or at least I would like to read these stories as not suggesting that that uh, domain of collective mobilization and collective struggles is inauthentic. That is not what they are saying. But there is another order of history which does not find its uh, space there. Another, uh, another dimension of uh, uh, affectability which cannot really find a space there, which is really what the, the stories are actually staging. And that level is important, in my view, for rethinking questions of agency and also for inventing new forms of uh, refusal and new forms of affirmation. Yeah. Professor Kumar, because you've been so kind to us, two more questions and maybe I'll club it together. Huh? They're different questions, but I'll just club it together. Okay. All right. Or post it separately, however you wish. One after the other. Let it be One after. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, the first, well, next question is from Vikram. Yes. Um, and the question reads, um, Professor Kumar, I request your thoughts on the leaving behind of the anagrammatical black life for it to be made as made a metaphor for others, for the black life to be a metaphor for modern life. Uh, sorry, I repeat. Hmm. I request your thoughts on the leaving behind of the anagrammatical black life for it to be made metaphor for others for the black life to be made a metaphor for modern life and now for marginalized subjects there. But doesn't the black life remain unassimilable? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram. This is really a, this is really the, the, the challenge. You know? This is really the, the problem. Uh, like you remember that in the, in the beginning when I was speaking about my earlier work around the social reform movements, one of the things which I was trying to get to was the creation of a certain template for writing community histories yeah? uh, in literature. You actually uh, present them as distinctive. You present them, uh, you annotate them as singular, but there's very uh, space within which you inscribe their singularity uh, already is a certain template in which they can be presented with irony, toleration, et cetera, et cetera. And where they become part of a, uh, uh, they become part of a pluralist conception of a larger uh, modern, you know, what, what to take your word, modern uh, Kerala history. Now, a similar kind of issue comes up about this uh, 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 valorization or paradigmatization. Let's put it that way, of black lives or Dalit lives where they become like a, uh, a traveling paradigm for uh, a condition, a condition which can be translated. Now, the problem with this, you know, the difficulty with this is that this is not, uh, 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 this is not entirely avoidable in some sense also, because the, if, if there is a black or Dalit universality, yeah, which is actually um, a, a different understanding of the universal, which is really about uh, reducing it to the lower threshold, 
a universality, not one of attributes, etc., etc. The path through which we arrive at uh, that idea of the universal is very likely to be of the most radical and critical edges of Dalit experience or Black experience. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about your question is about the idea of metaphorization. Now, can there be a way of connecting or uh, engaging with that idea of the universal without metaphor? That is really the question. And that, that is the challenge. That's a life challenge which we need to work with. I don't think there is a, it's an either or kind of question. Yeah. So the last question for the day is from Grace again. Yes. Um, in the, yes, the question is, in the inhabited world of Matthews, Norona and Miranda, there is a constant engagement of mourning and despair. What does that show about remembrance of past in these writers? Are they not able to come out of it, given as they are enslaved continuously? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Grace. You know, that, that is really what I was trying to indicate in those brief comments about Chavunilam. Uh, there is a specific speciality and a, a specific temporal organization in that novel. And the temporal organization is that of the curse whereas the spatial organization is that of the burial of bodies. Now that, that, is the, uh, that is the organization. And this notion of the curse is really about setting a horizon to temporal progress, temporal mo mo movement. It is kind of determining it, closing it, closing a certain kind of future. Yeah? And in that sense, it is very similar to what I described uh, in response to an earlier question as to what uh, one of the ghosts in one of IFM stories does, take a grip over time. Yeah? Now, what uh, Matthews's novel, uh, Javanilam, and uh, Miranda's first novel, uh, Requiem for the Living, uh, does is something similar, that there is a closed world, a world where a world of inaction a world where nothing can really move or change. But it's not as if it's a world without any apparent action. There is a lot of passion. There is a lot of uh, uh, conversation, friendships, violence, all these kinds of things are going on. But the time of that particular uh, universe seems to be enclosed in upon itself. That seems to be the... Uh, uh, the the trope through which they are trying to get to this afterlife uh, or the continued life of uh, a slave experience or uh, an unmitigated, not put to rest uh, life of history. Until that is activated, until that is made to live again, it looks as if this world cannot change. But uh, the novel seems to indicate that, uh, like towards the end of Chavanilam, there is a sign of some kind of release which begins to happen. But these things are very difficult to read in a literal sense because is that ending there to come to a narrative conclusion, something which cannot be concluded otherwise? Or is it that there is some kind of optimistic counter signature, which is given to this deeply, um, deeply gloomy, uh, gloomy, even gloomy is the wrong word, uh, a deeply indifferent or apathetic world. That is something which is difficult to uh, determine. And But what I'm interested in this is precisely this idea of a haunted present, which seems to be the mode in which you can relate to history unlike many other communities or many other kinds of subjectivities, here that seems to be the mode through which you can reach out and uh, actualize or give voice to a history, a certain past. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so very much.
uh, Professor Kumar. That was such a wonderful, wonderful evening. And thank you so much for indulging us and the very many questions that we have and had. Um, I now invite my colleague Aparna um, to deliver the official vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it has been an intellectual treat to listen to Professor Udaya Kumar speak. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made today's event successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our speaker, Professor Udaya Kumar, who has given us so much to think about. His talk was intellectually stimulating and reflective. And we thank Professor Kumar profusely for lending us his time and for sharing his insights with us. We are indeed grateful to you, Professor Kumar. As always, I would also like to thank our HOD, Professor Simi Malhotra. Thank you to Suman, Susan, Zera, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our event so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends. And we hope to see you all again very soon. And, and thank you for having me. And thank you for the questions. Thanks so much, Adair. Thanks so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.